1978, Deng Xiaoping became the chief political advisor of the Communist Party of China. Though he was never truly the chairman of the Communist Party, he became the de facto leader of the People's Republic of China in the late 1970s after the end of the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution can be best described of as a period of protracted political turmoil instigated by Mao after he fell out of favor within the Communist Party. During the Cultural Revolution, Mao traveled the country, going from commune to commune, giving a series of speeches and handing out rifles as well as copies of his Little Red Book to the Chinese youth. He would then encourage his devoted followers to effectively rebel against key figures in his own government, carrying out a series of purges and political violence targeted at those who were deemed capitalist rotors and enemies of the revolution. Deng was purged from the party multiple times, as well as being subjected to targeted harassment and public humiliation. He was eventually readmitted into the party and rose through the ranks once more with the aid of his friend and political ally, Zhu Enlai. Zhu was the premier of the CCP from the years 1954 to 1976. He was the chief diplomat involved in brokering peace talks between the People's Republic of China and the United States of America after Mao's health rapidly began to decline near the end of his life. Towards the end of the Cultural Revolution, Mao was succeeded by a faction known as the Gang of Four, which was comprised of devoted Maoists under the leadership of Zhang King. By his side stood three other young men by the names of, and forgive me if I butcher these names, Yao Wenyang, Wang Hongguen, and Zhang Chengqiao. The Gang of Four was the group directly responsible for coordinating with the Red Guard factions, as well as staging numerous political actions throughout the Cultural Revolution, all of which sought to beat out the rival non-Maoist tendencies within the Communist Party and keep China on the socialist road. Ultimately, the Gang of Four were defeated in the political arena after the death of Mao Zedong and Zhu Enlai in 1976 a defeat that had been heavily facilitated by Deng Xiaoping. The rise of Deng can be best thought of as a combination of the natural consequences of the negative fallout of the Cultural Revolution on one hand, whilst also being the logical continuation of a number of policies set up near the end of Mao's administration on the other. One such policy trend that was set by Mao included Three Worlds Theory, along with an alliance of convenience which he sought to forge with the capitalist West against the Communist Soviet Union. Another policy which had been in the works for some time was the Four Modernizations, albeit the implementation of had been actively delayed for years by the Cultural Revolution. The Four Modernizations program sought to strengthen China's industry, agriculture, military, and scientific developments through the opening up and liberalizing of its economy. This meant bringing back capitalism, fostering the emergence of new markets, and permitting foreign corporations to set up shop and exploit the Chinese workforce. And while these markets may be tightly regulated by the CCP, they are still markets nonetheless. And while central planning hasn't completely gone away in China, a significant chunk of its economy is now privately owned and controlled. And so it was under the tenure of Deng Xiaoping that China would all but abandon central planning, break up the communes, bring an end to Mao-era economic securities, permit an influx of landlords and capitalists into the party, and open up the Chinese economy to the West. On one hand, Deng was the overseer of one of the most rapid economic surges in history. On the other hand, he was the harbinger of the restoration of capitalism in China. It was underneath his tenure that the landlords that the Chinese revolutionaries fought so hard to liquidate were now provided the legal foundations necessary to make a return. The Iron Rice Bowl, a Mao-era policy which guaranteed a lifetime of employment, healthcare, benefits, and job security for Chinese workers was abolished. Waves of privatizations and liberalizations swept the country by storm, as China's impressive growth was also coincided by an explosion of wealth inequality and the flourishing of a new Chinese bourgeoisie. And with the economy now opened up, foreign investors now had the freedom to set up shop and exploit the Chinese proletariat. In this way, Deng's government had all but guaranteed the prolonging of capitalism's lifespan owed in large part to providing the transnational bourgeoisie with a colossal labor pool of cheap disposable workers numbering in the hundreds of millions and now in the billions. As of today, Deng Xiaoping theory is the philosophical foundation of the modern-day political economy of the People's Republic of China. 
Unlike Maoism or traditional Marxism-Leninism, Deng Xiaoping theory posits that the driving force behind the social progress of mankind isn't class struggle, but advances in the productive forces, i.e. scientific innovation, improvements in industrial capacity and output, economic growth, etc. Deng Xiaoping explains himself in a series of interviews and discussions that he had with fellow members of the CCP in the year 1980. Quote, Revolution means carrying out class struggle, but it does not merely mean that. The development of the productive forces is also a kind of revolution, a very important one. It is the most fundamental revolution from the viewpoint of historical development. Over the past 30 years since the founding of the People's Republic, we have laid the basic socialist foundation in agriculture, industry, and other areas. But we have a major problem, that is, we have wasted some time and our productive forces have developed too slowly. Since socialism is superior to capitalism, socialist countries should be able to develop their economies more rapidly than capitalist countries, improving their people's living standards gradually and becoming more powerful. We have suffered some setbacks in this respect. The objective of achieving the four modernizations was actually put forth by Chairman Mao and announced by Premier Zhu in his report on government work. But how did the Gang of Four respond? They said that it was better to be poor under socialism than to be rich under capitalism. It seems to them that socialism meant pauperism. Marxists have always held that socialism is superior to capitalism and that socialist countries should be able to develop their productive forces more rapidly than capitalist countries. Lin Bao and the Gang of Four totally deviated from the cardinal principle of Marxism-Leninism and Mao Zedong thought. Being a large country, China should play a more important role in the world, but owing to its limited strength, it cannot play a greater role. In the final analysis, what we should do is try to promote China's development. It is not enough to just say we are poor, and actually, we are very poor. Such a status quo is far from being commensurate with the standing of a great nation such as ours. Therefore, starting last year, we shifted our focus onto economic development. We should research earnestly how to carry out socialist development. At this time, we are reviewing the experience gained in the past three decades since the founding of the People's Republic. To sum up, it is as follows. First, we should not adopt leftist policies by divorcing ourselves from reality or skipping over necessary stages. Otherwise, the task of building socialism will not be accomplished. We have suffered losses from leftist policies. Second, whatever we do must contribute to developing the productive forces. In our effort to do this, we should stress economic results. Unless we develop the productive forces, we cannot gradually increase people's incomes. We have suffered a great deal in this respect, especially during the 10 years of the Cultural Revolution. We should research why so many African countries which have been developing socialism have become poorer and poorer. We should not consider it to be glorious merely to call our nation socialist, nor should we be content with this." Unquote. Deng Xiaoping, Selected Works. To build socialism, we must first develop the productive forces. In summary, Deng believed that since China had already had its revolution, in which the exploiters were overthrown by the exploited, on top of the fact that by this point in time China was still very poor and the industrial proletariat still only constituted a minority of the population, that the most important task at hand was economic growth not class struggle. This is the very essence of Deng Xiaoping theory in a nutshell, that socialism is about generating wealth and prosperity, not the ultimate emancipation of the proletariat. Deng Xiaoping theory presupposes that the exploiter classes have been defeated, that the Communist Party has a monopoly on the political power, therefore the class character of the state is still revolutionary proletarian in nature. It even asserts this much in the Constitution. Quote, in our country, the exploiting class, as a class, has been eliminated, but class struggle will continue to exist with a certain scope for a long time to come. The people of China must fight against those domestic and foreign forces and elements that are hostile and undermine our country's socialist system." Unquote. Straight out of the Chinese Constitution. Socialism with Chinese characteristics, also known as the socialist market economy, is the word used by Deng to describe China's current socio-economic model. It is a system in which a sizable chunk of industry, or the commanding heights if you will, 
are state property. In every area of heavy industry and some areas of light industry, there exist state-owned enterprises, or SOEs for short, which constitute a massive chunk of its GDP. As of 2023, nearly half of China's economy, or about 48%, is comprised of SOEs, while the majority of the workforce, around 80% of the population, are employed in the private sector. While China's economy is no longer centrally planned, the state does play an active, albeit limited, role in economic decision-making, as the Chinese government operates with astonishing foresight. Here in the United States, the average politician cannot even envision where the country will be within the next 10 years, let alone their next election cycle. On the other hand, the Chinese government at large is carrying out policies and decisions with a clear vision and goal for where China will be a hundred years from now. All one has to do is look at China's response to the coronavirus pandemic versus America's response, or lack thereof, to see the testaments of this fact. The Belt and Road Initiative also comes to mind. A gigantic hyperloop of bullet trains that will run from China into Russia, then through the Middle East, down into Africa, in which an intricate series of ports will be established leading back to mainland China. And the purpose of the Belt and Road is to put it shortly, to construct a highly advanced and efficient trade network between dozens of countries within Africa and Eurasia. This trade network will, on one hand, entrench China as a hegemonic trade-based superpower, while on the other hand, directly undercutting the power of the dollar and, by extension, the ability of the United States to leverage control of its currency over other countries. When this context is considered, along with the geographical positioning of Taiwan relative to the planned path of the Belt and Road, we can see why the U.S. cares so much about Taiwanese independence and desperately wants to keep the Republic of China from being reintegrated into the People's Republic of China. Chinese communists assert that China is in what is called the primary stage of socialism, in which a well-regulated capitalist economy can exist alongside a socialist economy. Quote, in the primary stage of socialism, the state shall uphold a fundamental economic system under which public ownership is the mainstay and diverse forms of ownership develop together, and shall uphold an income distribution system under which the distribution according to work is the mainstay, while multiple forms of distribution exist alongside of it." Unquote. Article 6 of the Chinese Constitution During the primary stage of socialism, capitalism is utilized as a driving mechanism behind economic growth. While the party wields all of the political power and utilizes it to guide the whole of the economy towards socialism. During the primary stage of socialism, the ownership of private property is both permitted and encouraged by the Communist Party, since in order to have a thriving capitalist economy, you need a thriving capitalist class. And so the political apparatus has fostered a situation where a myriad of markets and profitable investment opportunities can arise. To quote the Chinese constitution again, quote, Article 11, non-public economic sectors that are within the scope prescribed by law, such as individually owned and private businesses, are an important component of the socialist market economy. The state shall protect the lawful rights and interests of non-public economic sectors, such as individually owned and private businesses. The state shall encourage, support, and guide the developments of non-public economic sectors, and exercise oversight and regulation over non-public economic sectors in accordance with law. Article 13. Citizens' lawful private property is inviolable. The state shall protect the rights of citizens to own and inherit private property in accordance with the provisions of law. The state may, in order to meet the demands of the public interest and in accordance with the provisions of law, expropriate or requisition citizens' private property and furnish compensation." Unquote. Essentially, the idea of socialism with Chinese characteristics is that Deng is using capitalism to destroy capitalism. By allowing capitalism to thrive in China, new markets have been spurned and economic development can flourish. And once sufficient growth and accumulation has taken place, China can then take additional steps to transition closer and closer to full socialism over time. But in the time being, workers and owners will continue to exist and will coexist, and work in tandem with one another under the guidance of the CCP towards the collective interests of the PRC over time. Revisionism is, to put it bluntly, the distortion of core tenets of Marxist theory. In a word, 
the vulgarization, the bastardization of Marxist theory. What is the core of Marxist theory fundamentally? That class struggle is the primary driving force of social progress in the world today. And yet, Deng would have you believe that it is actually growth and accumulation that is the true driving force of social progress. This is a massive deviation from Marxist theory. As a matter of fact, it is the same deviation that Chinese communists accused Khrushchev of in their polemics, Khrushchev's phony communism. Quote, Khrushchev has carried out a series of revisionist policies serving the interests of the bourgeoisie and rapidly swelling the forces of capitalism in the Soviet Union. Under the pretext of combating the personality cult, Khrushchev has defamed the dictatorship of the proletariat in the socialist system and thus, in fact, paved the way for the restoration of capitalism in the Soviet Union. In completely negating Stalin, he has in fact negated Marxism-Leninism. Khrushchev sabotages the socialist planned economy, applies the capitalist principle of profit, develops capitalist free competition and undermines socialist ownership by the whole people. Khrushchev attacks the system of socialist agricultural planning, describing it as bureaucratic and unnecessary. The Khrushchev clique are spreading the tale that there are no longer antagonistic classes and class struggle in the Soviet Union, in order to cover up the facts about their own ruthless class struggle against the Soviet people." Unquote. Of course, while Khrushchev was a revisionist, he didn't carry out anything resembling the kind of wanton capitalist restoration of Deng Xiaoping. That being said, Deng Xiaoping theory operates on a similar premise. That class struggle is over in the People's Republic of China, since it has had its revolution, and now the people are in charge. That China is a dictatorship of the whole people rather than a dictatorship of the proletariat. That in order to achieve a higher stage of socialism, they now need to prioritize advances in the productive forces. And that the best way to do this is through the use of capitalist incentives and market mechanisms. Deng Xiaoping theory takes the relationship of the economic base and superstructure and flips it on its head by presupposing that it's the Communist Party who influences and controls the capitalist economy, not the other way around. When according to contemporary Marxism, the economic base gives rise to all elements within the superstructure, that is the government and societal institutions and so on, while the superstructure works to feed back into the continuous reproduction of the economic base, a capitalist economic base gives rise to liberal psychology and ideology, which by extension gives rise to capitalist superstructure. Within such a context, how much control is the Communist Party even able to meaningfully exert over the economy when, in order for capitalism to function, you need to set up state policies in order to cater to the needs and encourage capitalists to invest? And since the needs of the capitalists are inherently diametrically opposed to the needs of the workers, when class disputes and antagonisms inevitably arise, which group do you think the Communist Party will be poised to show political favor towards? There is now a thriving bourgeoisie in China. An actual bourgeoisie. Not an imaginary one like what supposedly existed in the post-Stalin USSR according to Ultras. Furthermore, there are capitalists within the Communist Party, as roughly 5% of its total membership are private business owners. And among the top income earners in the country, the wealthiest earners are overrepresented by capitalists and government bureaucrats by a wide margin. Even among the highest ranking party officials that aren't technically capitalists, they still enjoy exorbitant amounts of wealth to such a colossal degree that they may as well be. Xi Jinping himself has a net worth in the hundreds of millions. The Chinese constitution claims that the people are in control of China's political economy. But what do they mean by the people? The working class? The capitalist class? How can a government be a dictatorship of the proletariat if the capitalists are considered part of the people? Quote, We, the Chinese people of all ethnic groups, will continue, under the leadership of the Communist Party of China and the guidance of Marxism-Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, Deng Xiaoping theory, the theory of the three represents, the scientific outlook on the development of Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era, to uphold the people's democratic dictatorship, stay on the socialist road, carry out reform and opening up, steadily improve the socialist institutions, develop the socialist market economy and socialist democracy, improve socialist rule of law, apply the new development of philosophy, and work hard in a spirit of self-reliance to modernize step-by-step -step the country's industry, agriculture, 
national defense, and science and technology, and promote coordinated material, political, cultural, ethical, social, and ecological advancement in order to build China into a great modern socialist country that is prosperous, strong, democratic, culturally advanced, harmonious, and beautiful, and realize the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation." Unquote. Take note, viewer. The Chinese constitution doesn't clarify by saying working people. Instead, it merely references the people working in harmony to achieve higher levels of socialism with Chinese characteristics which at this point clearly does not mean a stateless, classless, moneyless society, but rather China as it is now, but with a really, really high gross national product. If the capitalists are considered part of the people, and they're expected to work in tandem with the rest of the people, then the foundation of modern China's political economy isn't based on class struggle, but class collaboration. The constitution then goes on to make the bold claim that the exploiting classes have been eliminated. Quote, in our country, the exploiting class, as a class, has been eliminated, but class struggle will continue to exist within a certain scope for a long time to come. The people of China must fight against those domestic and foreign forces and elements that are hostile and undermine our country's socialist system. Unquote. Take note again, no mention of class struggle between workers and owners, because apparently the owners within China don't actually count as owners even though the Chinese constitution makes it abundantly clear that the ownership and accumulation of private property is a fundamental right. Quote, Article 13. Citizens' lawful private property is inviolable. The state shall protect the right of citizens to own and inherent private property in accordance with the provisions of law. Unquote. So not only does the constitution omit all mention of its capitalist class and merely pay lip service to class struggle, not only does it pretend that the capitalists basically don't exist in a similar fashion that liberal governments do, it also allows and encourages the ownership and accumulation of private property. The fact of the matter is that China permits the outright existence of its national bourgeoisie, and it can't be any other way because, again, you need a thriving capitalist class to have a thriving capitalist economy. Quote, The future of China is closely bound up with the future of the world. China pursues an independent foreign policy, observes the five principles of mutual respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, mutual non-aggression, mutual non-interference in internal affairs, equality and mutual benefit, and peaceful coexistence." Unquote. It's funny how Khrushchev got scolded by Mao for pursuing a policy of peaceful coexistence with the West, only for China to end up basically siding with the West against the Soviets during the Cold War and then proceeding to completely abandon any and all international solidarity. Quote again, China consistently opposes imperialism, hegemonism, and colonialism, works to strengthen its solidarity with the people of all other countries, supports oppressed peoples and other developing countries in their struggles to win and safeguard their independence and develop their economies, and strives to safeguard world peace and promote the cause of human progress." Unquote. If any of that were true, it wouldn't currently and historically be upholding U.S. sanctions on North Korea. It wouldn't be continuing to do business with the state of Israel and would at the very least bring itself to boycott its genocide of Gaza. And as for the exploitation of Africa, all China is doing is giving these countries a better deal and offering them these low interest loans and forgiving them periodically when the debtor nations can't pay up. The African countries will continue to remain divided and exploited. You don't get this kind of explosion of income inequality under socialism, nor do you get the emergence of literal billionaires and landlords. I understand that the state has a legal right to expropriate private property, but that doesn't mean they're going to. The social alienation in particular is highly pronounced within the People's Republic, as young workers and college attendees alike slave away every waking moment of their lives in order to get ahead and stick out from their peers in a collective rat race that sees everyone involved suffer save the wealthy business folk who profit from this whole ordeal. To lax off or even let one's grades slip, even to a marginal degree, is heavily stigmatized by the student's peers and family alike. YouTuber Amy has a fantastic video about the widespread alienation experienced by Chinese youth, linked in the description below. I highly recommend it for a more comprehensive overview of the phenomenon. To make matters worse, 
It's pretty clear that the socialism by 2050 platitude being pushed by the likes of Xi Jinping doesn't actually mean the expropriation of the private economy and the full implementation of central planning, but the continued maintenance of the capitalist status quo. In a recent speech not too long back, Xi Jinping straight up said that China won't be returning to a planned economy. And if that's not enough proof for you, let's take a look at some quotes from his first volume of The Governance of China in his section about reforming and opening up. Quote, Reform and opening up is always an ongoing task and will never end. Without reform and opening up, China would not be what it is today, nor would it have the prospects for a brighter future. Problems occurring in reform and opening up can only be solved through reform and opening up. To advance reform and opening up, we must carry out the guidelines of the 18th National Congress and follow the guidance of Deng Xiaoping theory. The important thought of the three represents and the scientific outlook on development. In response to the calls of the people and their expectations for further reform and opening up, we should build a social consensus and promote reforms in all sectors in a coordinated way. The 18th National Congress set the goal for completing the building of a moderately prosperous society in all aspects and continuing reform and opening up, and emphasized that the party must, with greater political courage and wisdom, lose no time in continuing the reform in the key sectors, and resolutely discarding all notions and systems that hinder efforts to pursue sustainable development. Thirty-five years have passed since the party made the historic decision of shifting the focus of the work of the party and state to economic development and initiating the reform and opening up drive at the third plenary session of the 11th CPC Central Committee. The propelling force behind the improvements of the Chinese people's life, the advancement of our socialist country, the progress of our party, and the fact that China has gained important international status is no other than our perseverance in carrying forward the reform and opening up. During his inspection tour of the South in 1992, Deng Xiaoping said, if we did not adhere to socialism, implement the policy of reform and opening up to the outside world, develop the economy and raise living standards, we would find ourselves in a blind alley. Today, in retrospect, we have a better understanding of his remarks. This is why, as we are all aware, only socialism can save China, and only reform and opening up can develop China, socialism and Marxism. Unquote. Xi Jinping on the governance of China. Again, this all depends on a distorted interpretation of what socialism actually entails. Remember that, according to Deng, socialism isn't about the elimination of class society or the subjugation of the commodity form, or the bringing of an end to free market anarchy in favor of rational planning, but the development of the productive forces and improvements in living standards. These things are fine and dandy on their own, and we as socialists should absolutely care about creating wealth and improving the quality of life, but the creation of wealth and improvements in the quality of life on their own are not what socialism is. Take notice that Xi Jinping makes no mention of class struggle, expropriating means of production, nationalizing industry, doing away with market anarchy or commodity production, or even outlining a clear or defined path towards socialist planning. On the contrary, Xi clearly wants to maintain the current economic path that China is on, that of a well-regulated mixed market economy with a significant portion owned by SOEs. This is what he means by reform and opening up, the continued proliferation of new markets, the expansion of current markets, economic growth, increased trade with the outside world, and the solidification of China's relevance at the world stage as a hegemonic superpower. It is also important to note that Deng Xiaoping theory has a colossal lapse in judgment in its assumption that class struggle and economic accumulation are mutually exclusive, as though you can't have both of these things at the same time. Historically, the socialist system has accomplished just as much, if not even more so, on its own, just fine. Just look at the Soviet Union, and if there are problems within the socialist system, the answer to those problems certainly isn't the reintroduction of capitalism, but improvements within the socialist system. This is what the Soviet people actually wanted in 1991 when they overwhelmingly voted in favor of the preservation of the USSR. And I'm a firm believer that it could have been done and that the system could have been salvaged under the right leadership. Tragically, opportunists and capitalist rotors were able to take advantage of the ongoing political instability and, with both the backing and blessing of the West, 
proceeded to violently force capitalism down the throats of the Soviet people at gunpoint. But I digress. It is important to note that Deng Xiaoping is not a unique individual with respect to his politics. Dating back to the first, second, and third communist internationals, there have existed right-wing reformists with similar mindsets to Deng. The likes of Bernstein and Kautsky come to mind when I think of some OG revisionists. In Chapter 13 of Stalin's Economic Problems of the USSR, he criticizes fellow member of the Central Committee, L.D. Yaroshenko, for peddling a similar line of revisionism to Deng that puts the productive forces at the forefront while sidelining the importance of economic relations to the means of production. Quote, To describe Comrade Yaroshenko's opinion in a couple of words, it should be said that it is unmarxist and hence profoundly erroneous. Comrade Yaroshenko's chief error is that he forsakes the Marxist position on the question of the role of the productive forces and of the relations of production in the development of society. That he inordinately overrates the role of the productive forces, and just as inordinately underrates the role of relations to production, and ends up by declaring that under socialism the relations of production are a component part of the productive forces. As to the socialist system, where antagonistic class contradictions no longer exist, and where the relations of production no longer run counter to the developments of the productive forces, here, according to Comrade Yaroshenko, the relations of production lose every vestige of an independent role. They cease to be a serious factor of development, and are absorbed by the productive forces. If that is so, what is the chief task of the political economy of socialism? Comrade Yaroshenko replies, the chief problem of the political economy of socialism, therefore, is not to investigate the relations of production of the members of socialist society, it is to elaborate and develop a scientific theory of the organization of the productive forces in social production, a theory of the planning of economic developments. Comrade Yaroshenko thinks that it is enough to arrange a rational organization of the productive forces, and the transition from socialism to communism will take place without any particular difficulty. He plainly dares that, under socialism, the basic struggle for the building of a communist society reduces itself to a struggle for the proper organization of the productive forces and their rational utilization in social production." Unquote. Stalin then proceeds to repudiate Yaroshenko with quotes from Marx, explaining that if it weren't for the changes in relations to the means of production, that such advances in the productive forces would not have been possible in the first place that the Soviet Union owes its ongoing prosperity to its revolutionary class character, and that a socialist economy without a foundation upon socialist economic relations is in fact not a socialist economy at all. Quote, It is not true, in the first place, that the role of the relations of production in the history of society has been confined to that of a break, a fetter in the development of the productive forces. When Marxists speak of the retarding role of relations of production, it is not all relations of production that they have in mind, but only the old relations of production, which no longer conform to the growth of the productive forces. Can it be said that the role of the new relations of production is that of a break on the productive forces? No, it cannot. Nobody can deny that the development of the productive forces of our Soviet industry has made tremendous strides in the period of the five-year plans, but this development would not have occurred if we did not, in October 1917, replace the old, capitalist relations of production by new, socialist relations of production. It is not true, in the second place, that the production, i.e. economic relations, lose their independent role under socialism, that they are absorbed by the productive forces, that social production under socialism is reduced to the organization of the productive forces. Marxism regards social production as an integral whole which has two inseparable sides, the productive forces of society and the relations of production. These are two sides of social production, although they are inseparably connected. To assert that one of these sides may be absorbed by the other and be converted into its component part is to commit a very grave sin against Marxism. According to Marx, in every social formation, socialist society not excluded, has its economic foundation consisting of the sum total of men's relation to production. What, one asks, happens to the economic foundation of the socialist system with Comrade Yaroshenko? As we know, Comrade Yaroshenko has already done away with relations of production under socialism as a more or less independent sphere. 
and has included the little that remains of them in the organization of the productive forces. Has the socialist system, one asks, its own economic foundation? Obviously, seeing that the relations of production have disappeared as a more or less independent factor under socialism, the socialist system is left without an economic foundation. In short, a socialist system without an economic foundation. A rather funny situation. Is a socialist system without an economic foundation possible at all? Comrade Yaroshenko evidently believes that it is." Unquote. Economic Problems of the USSR is arguably one of Stalin's most important works, because irrespective of what anybody might think of him personally, there can be no denying that he oversaw the construction and maintenance of the first social system presiding over a massive geographical region roughly the size of South America. So I think we can take away some valuable insights from his practice. Funnily enough, Stalin even repudiated the concept of socialism with Chinese characteristics in his day as well. In a short polemic written by Stalin in July of 1949, he speaks of what the Chinese refer to as scenified socialism. In it, he discusses the general laws of socialism and, much like a communist Nostradamus, makes a borderline prophetic prediction that the rampant bourgeois nationalism within China would be preceded by its eventual slip into capitalist restoration and the ultimate abandonment of the international workers' movements. Quote, You speak of scenified socialism. There is nothing of the sort in nature. There is no Russian, English, French, German, Italian socialism, as much as there is no Chinese socialism. There is only one Marxist-Leninist socialism. It is another thing that in the building of socialism, it is necessary to take into consideration the specific features of a particular country. Socialism is a science, necessarily having, like all science, certain general laws, and one just needs to ignore them and the building of socialism is destined to failure. What are these general laws of building socialism? Number one, above all, it is the dictatorship of the proletariat, the workers and peasant state a particular form of the union of these classes under the obligatory leadership of the most revolutionary class in history, the class of workers. Number two, socialized property of the main instruments and means of production. Number three, nationalization of all capitalist banks, the merging of all of them into a single state bank, and strict regulation of its functioning by the state. Number four, the scientific and planned conduct of the national economy from a single center obligatory use of the following principle in the building of socialism, from each according to his capacity to each according to his work, distribution of the material good depending upon the quality and quantity of the work of each person. Number five, obligatory domination of Marxist-Leninist ideology. Number six, creation of armed forces that would allow the defense of the accomplishments of the revolution and always remember that any revolution is worth anything only if it is capable of defending itself. Number seven, Ruthless armed suppression of counter-revolutionaries and foreign agents. As far as I know, in the CPC there is a thin layer of the proletariat, and the nationalist sentiments are very strong, and if you will not conduct genuinely Marxist-Leninist class policies, and not conduct struggle against bourgeois nationalism, the nationalists will strangle you. Then not only will the socialist construction be terminated, China may become a dangerous toy in the hands of American imperialists, in the building of socialism in China, I strongly recommend you fully utilize Lenin's splendid work, The Immediate Tasks of Soviet Power. This would assure success." Unquote. Keep in mind that Stalin wrote this letter in 1949, that China split from the USSR in 1956. In 1966, the Cultural Revolution began along with China's subsequent rivalry with the USSR. In 1973, Mao met with the leaders of the West in the pursuit of a joint alliance against the Soviets, and in 1978 that Deng, a bourgeois nationalist, took power and rolled out the opening up and liberalization of China. Within every government on Earth, no matter what the era or country, the previous administration always sets the precedent for the next, even if the previous administration was overthrown by the next such as was the case with the People's Republic of China. The Chinese Revolution was not just a socialist revolution, but a bourgeois democratic revolution as well, as the revolutionary charge was not led just by the proletariat, but a joint coalition of proletarians, peasantry, the petty bourgeoisie, and the national bourgeoisie. It was not a situation like Tsarist Russia, 
in which the nation was predominantly semi-feudal with a small capitalist sector within the cities. Instead, under Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang, China was a backwards, outright feudalist, colonized nation being actively oppressed by the British and Japanese. As in China, there was a 10 to 1 ratio between peasants and workers, compared to a 3 to 1 ratio in the old Russian Empire. Though pre-revolutionary Russia may have been the poorest country in Europe, pre-revolutionary China was the poorest country on Earth. For these reasons, the Chinese Revolution was once again a coalition between classes, the workers, the peasants, the petty bourgeoisie, and the national bourgeoisie. And it was these four classes that are signified by the four stars on the Chinese banner. Much like the hammer and sickle signifies the union between workers and peasants in the Soviet Union, the four stars signifies the four prominent classes within China, while the fifth star signifies the rule of the Communist Party. So one can see how within the context of China, these elements of bourgeois nationalism and class collaboration came as inherent features of its revolution. Mao Zedong once wrote of this alliance between the classes within China. He referred to it as New Democracy. New Democracy posited that the revolutionary transition towards socialism would take decades of reforms to accomplish, and that the Chinese bourgeoisie had a uniquely progressive character that the bourgeoisie of other nations did not. He even describes the Communist Party as a joint dictatorship of classes, rather than a dictatorship of the proletariat. Quote, Being a bourgeoisie in a colonial and semi-colonial country and oppressed by imperialism, the Chinese national bourgeoisie retains a certain revolutionary quality at certain periods and to a certain degree. In this respect, the Chinese bourgeoisie differs from the bourgeoisie of old Tsarist Russia, since Russia was a military feudal imperialism which carried on aggression against other countries, the Russian bourgeoisie was entirely lacking in revolutionary quality. But China's national bourgeoisie has a revolutionary quality at certain periods and to a certain degree. Here, the task of the proletariat is to form a united front with the national bourgeoisie against imperialism and the bureaucrat and warlord governments without overlooking its revolutionary quality. Therefore, the proletariat, the peasantry, the intelligentsia, and the other sections of the petty bourgeoisie undoubtedly constitute the basic forces determining China's fate. These classes, some already awakened and others in the process of awakening, will necessarily become the basic components of the state and governmental structure in the Democratic Republic of China. This new Democratic Republic will be different from the old European-American form of capitalist republic under bourgeois dictatorship. On the other hand, it will also be different from the Socialist Republic of the Soviet type under the dictatorship of the proletariat, which is already flourishing in the USSR. However, for a certain historical period, this form is not suitable for the revolutions in the colonial and semi-colonial countries. During this period, therefore, a third form of state must be adopted in the revolutions of all colonial and semi-colonial countries, namely, the New Democratic Republic. Thus, the numerous types of state systems in the world can be reduced to three basic kinds according to the class character of their political power. Number one, republics under bourgeois dictatorship. Number two, republics under the dictatorship of the proletariat. And number three, republics under the joint dictatorship of several revolutionary classes. The state system, a joint dictatorship of all of the revolutionary classes in the system of government, democratic centralism, these constitute the politics of new democracy the Republic of New Democracy, the Republic of the Anti-Japanese United Front, the Republic of the New Three People's Principles with their three great policies, the Republic of China in reality as well as in name." Unquote. Mao Zedong Selected Works Article on New Democracy During this period of new democracy, Mao Zedong sought to preserve the capitalist economy while encouraging China's national bourgeoisie to collaborate with the state. Under new democracy, the state would wield direct control over the commanding heights, if you will, while a significant private sector would exist alongside it for a few decades after the revolution was complete. Quote, In the new democratic republic under the leadership of the proletariat, the state enterprises will be of a socialist character and will constitute the leading force in the whole national economy. But the republic will neither confiscate capitalist private property in general, nor forbid the development of such capitalist production as does not dominate the livelihoods of the people, for China's economy is still very backward." Unquote. Does any of this sound familiar to you, viewer? Because it sounds like socialism with Chinese characteristics to me. 
i.e. the revolution is complete, the Communist Party is now in power, the state wields the commanding heights, etc., etc., the classes will continue to exist side by side, under the party's leadership and guidance, etc., etc., we have to shift our focus towards building the productive forces, etc., etc. I bring this up because, again, both Deng Xiaoping and Xi Jinping, along with numerous other rightist reformers, consistently reference new democracy in many of their written works, and routinely make appeals to Mao Zedong thought as to justify and legitimize their policies. In this way, socialism with Chinese characteristics could be seen as a return to the era of new democracy in China, if you will. Of course, Mao faced significant left-wing resistance in the party, who saw new democracy as capitulating to capitalism, and that the whole of the economy should be nationalized right away. In a speech titled, Don't Strike Out in All Directions, Mao argued the following against his detractors. Quote, The whole party should try earnestly and painstakingly to make success of its united front work. We should rally the petty bourgeoisie and the national bourgeoisie under the leadership of the working class and on the basis of the worker-peasant alliance. The national bourgeoisie will eventually cease to exist, but at this stage, we should rally them around us and not push them away. We should struggle against them on one hand and unite with them on the other. We should make this clear to the cadres and show by facts that it is right and necessary to unite with the national bourgeoisie, the democratic parties, democratic personages, and intellectuals. Many of them were our enemies before, but now that they have broken with the enemy camp and come over to our side, we should unite with all these people who can be more or less united with." Unquote. On one hand, one could interpret new democracy as a necessary compromise akin to the new economic policy under Vladimir Lenin following the end of the Russian Civil War of the 1920s. After all, the early USSR was both in shambles from all of the fighting, as well as incredibly backward and underdeveloped. And this was much the same case in China back in 1949 following its revolution if not even more so since up to that point, China had just endured its century of shame as an even more backward, even more undeveloped, outright feudalist, colonized nation. On the other hand, a revolutionary government is playing a dangerous game by permitting capitalists within their midst, as it won't be long before the capitalists begin to profiteer and conspire against the government and threaten to undo all of the progress made by the revolution. This is why it is the job of communists in the oppressed, undeveloped, colonized nations to form a united front with its national bourgeoisie, overthrow the colonizers, carry out the national bourgeois democratic revolution at first, and then immediately carry out its socialist revolution as soon as humanly possible. We saw this exact trend unfold in the Russian Empire. Russia first had its bourgeois democratic revolution in 1905, then its socialist revolution in 1918. And to the credit of Mao Zedong, he did inevitably backtrack on new democracy in the early 1950s and made a full-on push towards actual socialist political economy when it became clear that the corruption and profiteering of the Chinese bourgeoisie was getting out of hand. During the Five Anti-Campaign carried out under his leadership, the Communist Party sought to identify and combat the Five Poisons being perpetuated by the capitalist class. The Five Poisons included bribery, tax evasion, theft from the state, cheating on government contracts, and theft of economic intelligence. After thorough investigation, it was now abundantly clear to Communist Party officials and volunteers that the Chinese capitalists were all engaging in these illegal activities to varying degrees, and by extension actively undercutting and undermining the state. As it turns out, nobody becomes filthy rich without ruthlessly cheating and exploiting their fellow man. And so in light of this information, Mao proceeded to all but abandon new democracy and make a deliberate push towards nationalizing and socializing the whole of the Chinese economy. From here on out, the Mao-era administration of the PRC became primarily driven by a policy of aggressive class struggle. Between 1966 and 1976, Mao had instigated an aggressive campaign of class warfare against bourgeois elements within the party known as the Cultural Revolution. I'll leave it at that for now because the Cultural Revolution is deserving of its own video, but once again, to Mao's credit, he actively fought tooth and nail to rid China of corruption and other bourgeois elements that would see capitalism restored at a superstructural level. On the other hand, he also deliberately alienated his country from the Soviet Union, 
causing a split in the global communist movements which left China politically isolated and estranged from all of its potential allies, which ironically enough, would inadvertently set the stage for the rise of Deng Xiaoping and the opening up and reforming of China's economy. I'd like to finish this very lengthy and rather dry video essay on a positive note by saying the following. If there is any country that could transition to full socialism within our lifetimes, it is the People's Republic of China. While the Chinese political establishment doesn't plan on expropriating the capitalists or reintroducing five-year plans anytime soon, there is a plethora of evidence that is indicative of the existence of strong proletarian elements within the CCP. Proletarian elements that are strong enough to lead the CCP to carry out policies with incredible economic foresight to the benefit of the general public. I bring up the Belt and Road Initiative once again. I bring up their COVID response yet again. Another example that I'd like to touch up on is China's real estate market. Here in the United States, our GDP growth is fueled by inflation and rampant speculation, while in China, its GDP growth is fueled by actual advances in industrial capacity and advancing technology. That is to say, US GDP growth is fictitious while Chinese GDP growth is real. In recent years, the growth rate of China's real estate has significantly diminished as its housing market has experienced recession. Traditionally, whenever a country's housing market goes bust, the state typically swoops in and utilizes quantitative easing to bail out the biggest investors at the expense of the taxpayer. That is not at all how China has responded to this crisis. Instead, they simply popped the real estate bubble and let it crash. Big investors in China operated under the delusion that the CCP would ultimately bail them out in a similar fashion to the Western bourgeois states. And when that didn't happen, the real estate market contracted, investors lost their asses on the market, and the value of Chinese real estate shrunk by a factor of tens of trillions of yuan, or hundreds of billions of dollars. As of now, the value of housing in China has steadily declined, and the Chinese government has instead opted to increase investment into renewable energy, electric vehicles, space exploration, and industrial expansion. This sort of behavior is completely unheard of among capitalist states. Here in the West, so much of our GDP is tied into housing speculation that whenever there's a huge financial crisis, the governments will simply bail out the stock market. Certainly, the last thing that they would ever do is actually let the bubble burst so that housing prices can actually come down and become affordable for working people. Otherwise, it's pretty clear that China is tackling this issue from an angle of decommodification. In regards to China's housing policy, I believe President Xi Jinping put it best. Houses are for living, not for speculation. Speaking of inflation, did you know that the opposite is occurring in China? Over the last few years, supply has been consistently outpacing demand, leading to a net reduction in the cost of consumer goods, and by extension, a net reduction in the cost of living. This deflation is transpiring, mind you, while Chinese wages and employments have only grown. In other words, the wealth of the average Chinese worker is increasing, while the opposite trend is occurring here in the United States and much of the rest of the Western world. Here in America, people are only getting poorer, as American workers are plagued by sky-high rents, underemployment, stagnating poverty wages, and rampant inflation. Of course, the Western world treats this widespread deflation and economic contraction as signs that China is in severe crisis, with alarmist news articles and various social media grifters constantly assuring us that China is on the brink of collapse and will disintegrate any day now. The reason for this is because deflation and contraction are objectively bad things for capitalism, because capitalism demands infinite growth and inflation in order to function. That's why despite the perpetual stock panics every 7 to 10 years here in the US, the cost of goods and services never seems to decline and the consumer price index only seems to get worse. However, the CCP has a different philosophy when it comes to the way they manage their economy. Unlike the United States, the CCP actually gives a damn about elevating people's living standards and improving the quality of life. This is why it's willing to let certain sectors of the economy, such as the housing market, contract while continuously pouring its resources into the sectors of the economy that generate actual value rather than fictitious value. 
Here's an example of yet another industry that China has invested heavily in in recent years that actually does generate massive value in return. Over the last year, China sank nearly $900 billion into renewables and green energy investments, becoming the world leader in clean energy growth. As a result, the lion's share of China's recent GDP expansion has been fueled in the developments of renewable energy. From solar power to windmills, to nuclear power and electric cars, to its light railways and overhauled power grid, etc. Meanwhile, the United States, which has instead opted to devote all of its resources to propping up its stock market and fossil fuel subsidies, is in the process of imposing sanctions on Chinese green energy companies and the silicon trade. At the same time, U.S. oil production continues to be on the rise with no end in sight, breaking yearly records on an almost annual basis, it is simultaneously going out of its way to undermine China's green energy initiative. Isn't it good to know that while China is at the very least making a good faith effort to get away from fossil fuels and combat climate change, that the United States, as it has always done since its inception, is actively getting in the way of human progress, and if left to its own devices will be the ruin of us all? Now, before anybody jumps to the wrong conclusions, I'm not saying that any of this necessarily proves that China's economy is socialist. What I am saying is that traditional capitalist countries do not conduct themselves in this manner at all. It just simply doesn't happen. Not without strong proletarian influence within its political machinery. So while China may not be socialist at this time, one final major point that I would like to put forth is that if there's any country on earth that could accomplish a peaceful transition towards socialism within our lifetimes, that that country is most definitely the People's Republic of China. Again, while the Belt and Road Initiative, COVID quarantine lockdowns, and green energy investment don't necessarily prove that China's economy is socialist, it is evidence that there is a significant working class influence within the party. So much so that if said proletarian elements can win a number of key decisive victories in the political arena, with additional help from a strong international communist movement, as well as the Chinese masses from below, that they could potentially succeed in seizing control of the levers of power and carrying out socialist reform. So while the CCP is an ideologically diverse melting pot, including but not limited to the likes of anarchists and nationalists, as well as conservatives and liberals, being a party that is comprised of some 90 million individual members, given the formidability and political potence of the CCP, its ability to carry out and execute its political will, along with its reactivity, foresight, response time, and ability to assess and accommodate the needs of the general public. The People's Republic of China thus possesses for itself the political infrastructure that is needed to transition towards full socialism under the right material conditions within our lifetimes. But once again, the working class cannot achieve its ultimate emancipation without the ceaseless efforts and ruthless discipline of the communists. Responsibility falls chiefly and primarily on the Chinese proletariat to engage in class struggle against their own respective bourgeoisie and win out in the political arena, just as it is our responsibility within the United States to do the same. It's important to note that with respect to China's foreign policy, they are very much passive and benign when it comes to the way that they engage with the rest of the world. They won't go out of their way to stand up for what is right out of principle, golden example being the conflicts between Israel and Palestine, if it results in a conflict of interests with the Western world and its allies. In this way, China bends over backwards to accommodate the transnational bourgeoisie, rather than challenging them like the Soviet Union did back during the Cold War. In this way, China is a country that tends to follow rather than lead. The rest of the world is predominantly capitalist, and thus, in order to avoid rocking the boat and appeasing the global capitalist order, China is also, therefore, capitalist. I truly do believe that China will become socialist eventually, but this can only happen once the international communist movement grows strong enough to win a number of decisive victories and establish a new working-class counter-hegemony akin to the communist bloc of old. Only then, when the workers' movement grows strong enough globally, do I believe that China's leadership will see the writing on the wall and follow suit. So in short, China will not save us. It is on us to save ourselves.